welcome to the latest episode of All Brother, a podcast about Salford slash Manchester's legendary musical institution, The Fall. Each week we invite along a guest to chat about their experience and memories of the group. You can find us at Spotify, Apple and all the usual suspects, but we're hosted at play.acast.com forward slash s forward slash All Brother. All episodes are also available on YouTube. Search for the All Brother podcast and subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. This week we're joined by musician, inspiral carpet, DJ and all-out Manchester legend, Mr Clint Boone who discusses his fascinating career and his many interactions with the fall. Hope you enjoy it. Right, welcome to the latest episode of Old Brother, a fall podcast with me, Paul Hanley, and my much more famous brother, Steve. Um, Give over. (laughs) Give over. (laughs) We're we're delighted to welcome uh, somebody along today who's kind of synonymous with Manchester music, uh, right from from the early days of 76, and he's, he's... appeared in sort of every kind of movement since. He's also worked with uh, Marky e. Smith and very nearly worked with the four, but we'll get on to that. Uh, so uh, I'd like to say hello to you. Welcome, Clint Boone. How are you doing, brother? Okay. Nice to speak to you both. Yeah. You well? Yeah, really good. And I think you're both, you're both equally famous in my mind, so... <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, right. we, well, we did. I didn't have to explain who I was before we started recording, if you remember, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, so... You were the you were at the, um, the Pistols at the Electric Circus, is that right? You must have been very young then to get be coming from Oldham all the way to Colliers. Yeah, I, it was December of seventy six, so it wasn't the Lesser Free Trade All gig that happened in July, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was at college in Rochdale doing. I was at the Art College in Rochdale, um, and I was fortunate that at that time, I mean, you, you know, late seventy five and then through seventy six. We, we used to work in an open plan studio in the college. You know, we, we didn't have a, it was like a, how would you call it, like a workshop. And we all just had our own spaces and we had a communal record player. So people would bring in records. And I remember when I started at art college, it was people bringing in stuff like Steely Dan and the Eagles and stuff that I didn't really resonate with. You know, I was more into my fifties rock and roll. But then through the summer of 76 or early 76 through to summer, we started getting these new records that were like, really edgy and it wasn't called punk at the time it was just you know it'd be a band called the damned or it'd be you know this band from new york called the ramones and these records started appearing in the uh the common room if i can use that term or the studio and um it was just that record play i can i can vividly picture it now as well i can i could i could probably draw a decent picture of the actual record but it was such a central part of everything we did at art college and these records if you brought your record in you knew that it was going to die in that room because you know there'd be some guy working with uh, ceramics or you know, pottery and he'd turn the record over and that would be the first two tracks dead with all the clay and the grooves. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and it was just that uh, you knew that if you brought a record in, you, you were sort of sacrificing it to the cause. And I remember when the Pistols brought out the first single, that was like just every day we'd be going off to uh, the record shop in uh, Rochdale to buy a new copy of it, you know, well, every week. It was just like it, it, your records would get trashed, but the the shared experience that we we got from that was like such a massive part of um, that transition from being a 50s rock and roll kid to becoming, you know, right in the heart of the punk movement. So It's a good job, it's a good job you didn't know how much them uh, Anakin in the UK and EMI would be worth it today. Yeah, you, I know. Upset. You know what, I've still got those somewhere, somewhere in my... I'm a hoarder, me, so I've got boxes of stuff all over the house and in storage and that. And somewhere I've got an original Anakin in the UK poster. Wow. You know, now they're worth a lot of money now, and I'm, I'm sure at some point when I'm going through all these boxes, I'm going to find it and uh, straight on eBay... That's your retirement yeah. fund right there, there, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. We were yes, talking, like, but, sorry, I was going to say, we were yeah. talking about this yesterday, about, and because there's that, there's that thing with the uh, Joy Division thing now and what have you, and there's a, there was an auction where Ian Curtis's passport photo oh. that he took for the tour of America that never happened, yeah. up for auction, and it's what was it worth, Steve? 7,000 was Oof. the bid. Oof. That's but, brilliant. So, you, want to, you want to look after that poster? Look after yeah. that bloody poster, yeah, Christ. Well, I've got I've got passport photos of Noel Gallagher that are original, as, as they were when you get used to get four on a, on a sheet. Yeah, like we, I remember going. There used to be a little photo booth place on um, Oxford Road. It's a like, it's a, a little camera shop, but they used to take your passport photos for you. And I remember going to Noel on several occasions. You know, getting photographs for um, forthcoming European tours. You know, for your visa or the American trip that was coming up. Um, and we'd always swap like because you only needed two or three for the. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> For the the trip, so, I mean, we'd always swap the last one. I'd give him my copy, and you know, he'd give me his. And I've still got some of these original 
Uh, passport right. photos of Noel Gallagher. I'm not saying he's up there with Ian Curtis yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, maybe you the... hang on to them. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it was on Instagram, that was. Absolutely, wasn't it? Can I go back yeah. to that, that period? Look, I didn't answer your question about the, uh, the electric circus gig. So yeah. that period of being at art college... And I was also fortunate that one of the guys at art college with me, he's in the year above me, but very much part of our team, <clears throat> was um, Phil Diggle, whose right. brother, brother uh, Steve was in this band called Buzzcocks. And, and he'd always be talking to us. Do you know Phil, either of you? I don't know. He, very charismatic he's a friend of character. Craig's, isn't he, Paul? Yeah, I think he did know Craig. Yeah, because Craig's <coughs> from Oldham as well, wasn't he? Or, yeah, yeah. And it's, they've got a sister, haven't they, that Craig knew? Right. Yes. But Phil was very charismatic, great artist. I mean, to this day, he's a very well-known artist based in London. And he'd always do this thing. He was a smoker, but if he didn't have a cigarette in his hand, he'd still have the mannerisms of smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and he'd be like, oh, guys, listen, our kids band, Buzzcocks, are doing a gig tonight. You should really come and check them out, you know. And it was like, just it, it was him who sort of tips us off to the Electric Circus gig that was happening where the Buzzcocks were supporting Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers, The Clash, and The Sex Pistols. Wow. Uh, and and it, it, yeah, yeah. Thursday night, Thursday the 9th of December it was. So we went straight from art college, literally, you know, finished our art college work for the day, got on a bus down to Collierhurst and watched this gig. And risked it just your, risked your life getting in. Risked our life. I didn't realize on the night, I think it was more subsequent visits to the electric circus. I think on that night, I was just in awe of the the, the, the moment, you know, we were going yeah. down, down, we're all in our, we, we had these uh, sort of outfits that we designed. Before punk, we used to, we used to go to the local Oxfam shop in, um, Rochdale, and we'd buy like dinner suits, you know, like old, old man's dinner suits, black, and then we'd mm. paint the collars in white PVA glue and uh, the the pocket flaps and the cuffs. So we had a, we had this quite unique look that was our thing that art students did back then. So it wasn't part of punk; it was before punk. We were like we're art students; we want to just look like a bunch of twats, you know. That's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was that, wasn't he, Phil Diggle? He did like buscock shirts and stuff. He did that secret. I remember Steve Diggle had this great. Sort of uh, buzzcock shirt, the pink thing with the like a bit like the Love You More cover. Yeah, Steve Diddler done for him. And I, I, if I've ever coveted anything from anybody in a band, I wanted that shirt. I mean, it yeah. wouldn't have fit me, like. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so that, that was. I was just fortunate that, that that moment in time that I was part of turned out to be a real piece of history. Not 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 as much a piece of history as the Lesser Free Trade All gig, but to me. To see, to see the pistols and the clash on the same bill, you know, for like one pound uh, fifty. I think it was one pound fifty to get. It might be yeah. one pound twenty to be there on that night and to realise in the moment that this was my life changing, literally in front of my eyes. Because this was the point where I realised that I didn't need to just dream about being a pop star, you know, because that's what I'd done until that point. I'd I was always wanted say, to. Be... I was going to ask you if you had thoughts of being in a band before that. Then uh, I had. I mean, I, I thought more about you know from being, you know seven, eight, nine-year-old, I just wanted to be like Elvis Presley. So it wasn't even a band. It was like, I just wanted to be like hmm. Elvis, you know what I mean? So, But I didn't do anything about it. I didn't try to learn to play any instruments or anything because I, I, I think I was convinced that I didn't have it in me. I didn't have a decent voice. I've, you know, As you know, I'm from Oldham. I've got this bloody impediment, I? the Oldham accent. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really think I was ever going to pull it off and I didn't really do anything about it. You know, I didn't learn to play an instrument. Um, and it's just, you know, that night, but seeing punk happen and, be, you know, seeing... Steve Diggle on stage, who's you know, my mate's brother from lives on Broadway. It's like I, I could probably do this. I could probably get, give this a shot, and that's what happened. I mean, within months, I dropped out of college because until that point, the, the plan was that I would have gone off to university or whatever, you know, art uni, what they used to call it back then, yeah, to do a degree and you know maybe become a teacher or you know an artist in my own right, or whatever. But it was just everything just made sense that night. It was like I know where I'm going now. I'm going to. I dropped out of college. I think by. Easter, I think I, I dropped out of college. Uh, got a job in a local steel uh, steel factory just to earn some money so I could start getting equipment, you know, buying music gear and going to gigs, etc. And just started being, I put myself in that world of uh, live mm -hmm. music, you know, right. because, because of yeah. punk. And that led on to everything that I do to this day is because of that moment, really. Yeah. So uh, while we're on the electric circus, you were at the last night electric circus where the fall were on, weren't you? You were at that gig. Yeah, and that's where I'm. I'm convinced I, that that was the first time I'd seen the fall. Um, I think it was a fir quite early gig for them, yeah. wasn't it? Um, yeah. That was October '77, and I think they'd only started gigging in summer of '77, so a, a relatively early gig. But I, I wasn't aware of the fall, and that night I remember when they came on stage. It was like this is different. This is because it. I think punk had got into a bit of a, a rut. If you if you know, there's like certain cliches that all the bands had. 
you know, they were all angry. They're all a bit scuffy. They'd have slogans written on the shirts. And you know what I mean? There was like, there was, there was a uniform. Yeah. And there was, there, was, there was a way of dancing. You know, if you're in a band, this is how you moved. And, yeah. it, you know, when, when the fall came on, it was like, fucking hell, this is like, they look like he looks like he should be in a cabaret band. Yeah. You know, singing fucking uh, Crackling Rosie or something. <laughs> what was that yeah. nice shirt on, Mark? Didn't it? it was a little... Oh, it's satin shirts. I, yeah, I remember yeah. sat, it really influenced me because I started wearing satin shirts after I first saw him, and I've still got most of them here because, you know, my early Inspiral gigs, I, I wore a lot of shirts that were very Mark Smith style. Yeah, how I much thought, stuff have you got in your house? Oh, you should <laughs> see it, Mark. I'm sat here. I'm glad this isn't a video one because I'm just surrounded by boxes. And I mean, honestly, I've got stuff here dating back to the like songs that I wrote in the early 1970s wow. into the cassette machine and me, all that. Me and Paul are the complete opposite, aren't we? Got you think Feng Shui? You think Shui? Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> I've got, I've, there's I've, nothing I've, to move about. I've got nothing, it, mate. Absolutely it, nothing. Was it Feng Shui or did you both go bankrupt? <laughs> never, never. I've never been never in a store. Right. No. I've never had anything to sell. I would have sold it if I'd had it, but no, I'm I'm, I'm not a big on stuff. Right. I, you I know what? I, I think with me, I'm not, I'm not materialistic. I, I never have been. But I've always been at one to document what's going on. Yeah. So I've got a lot of photographs. Cool. I've got, I've got, I'm looking here. More of it, yeah. yeah, I've got boxes here of slides, you know, transparencies and cassette yeah. tapes and DAT tapes, Betamax audio tapes. And I've just saved everything that we ever did. I remember Bill Wyman used to be like that with the Stones, yeah, didn't he? Yeah. And, and I think I've turned into a bit of like the Bill Wyman of the Inspirals, I think. Don't I mean, it's, it's a. Somebody has to do it, don't they? That's the thing. I, I, I'm not saying that. I, I, sh- I wish I had, there's loads of stuff I wish I had kept. Yeah, but just just to have it, not because it was worth money or anything, just to see it, you know. Yeah, somebody had them. Um, funnily enough, somebody was put on their Twitter today a picture of the T-shirt from the last gig I did with the Fall, which was at Royal Court. It was New Order, the Smiths. Yeah, from Manchester the Fall, and, John, and John Cooper Clark, and somebody. It was the guy from Memorial Device. This is my, and he he's got the T-shirt, and I was think I said. I'd really like that T-shirt. I don't want to buy it off you, by the way, but I would really... That's my last gig of the fall, man. <laughs> I mean, there's loads of stuff like that that I wish I'd kept. Yeah, I've got it's it all here, yeah. I mean, right. going back to Mark's dress that night, he had he had shiny shoes on as well, <clears throat> which was just not, not a done thing in punk. Nope. I mean, I know the jam were a bit modish, so they had the, the elements of that. But yeah, Mark just... He, he looked different the way he was dressed. He danced... He had a completely unique way of moving. He wasn't trying to be yeah. macho. He had, he had like a little skip to his... A little skip in his mm. step and... Um, it was any, that little dancer used to be. Kind of dropped that pretty quick, did it? It, it was more like it, it's more like setting the ground for what Jarvis Cocker ended up doing in yes. terms of the way he moved. Very, you know, quite camp at times, but definitely. Um, yeah. and, and and you know, and then on top of all that, these incredible songs that they had. You know, the first generation of fall songs, mm, yeah. <clears throat> like Dresden Dolls and Industrial yeah. Estate. They had was it a student that became a fascist, or no, it was a yeah, fascist that became a student. Right. And it's just these songs are like just incredibly catchy and. Not that I understood what was going on about with a lot of them, but no, yeah. to me it was just this. Even though it was the last night, it was the last night of the Electric Circus, and I was gutted that it was the end of an era. You know, I was I was already mourning it in a way that I did when the Hacienda went later on and the boardwalk. Yeah. It was the last night of the circus, and I knew that this wasn't a good moment. No, um, and but when I saw the fall, it was like, but this is probably the next chapter for me, yeah. uh, and it, it was. I it mean, was like it's so good that. Uh... Album that came out from that, yeah. The uh, the 10 inch one, the blue one, yeah. The last night, electric yeah. circuit, short circuit, is it called? Yeah, it yeah. Is, yeah. I've got it, yeah. 10 inch blue vinyl. Um, and the fall do stepping out on that one, yeah. I yeah. used to believe everything I read, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, just and, and fortunately, I mean, I had a, a friend, a, a girl that I'd met called Karen Drinkwater, uh, sorry, Karen Reed at the time, she was an hairdresser, she's now Karen Drinkwater, but she's the oldest friend in, in my, my life. I've known her for longer than anybody else apart from family. And I met her at the, about the same time at the Electric Circus, and she was connected with The Fall. Um, and I think she'd become friends with Carl Burns initially, and she ended up driving The Fall to a lot of gigs. She had wow. a, a Volkswagen Beetle, and her dad had this Jag that, if he wasn't using it, she borrowed the Jag, and she'd be taking The Fall to these gigs, you know, local, you know, pubs and working men's clubs and some of the earliest gigs so through karen i was invited into the inner sanctum of the first lineup of the fall wow which again you know at the time and over the years i've, I've, always, I've always treasured those memories and valued it but what what an what an important moment to be part of to, to be in that dressing room i was i was that quiet kid in the corner you know i wasn't a big character I, not like i am now <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's like when i think back it's like that is surreal that I was in, you know, countless gigs with 
the fall backstage and uh, you know and it was it was Carl it was Una it was Tony it was Martin Brammer yeah um, it just a classic well I mean there's a lot of other classic lineups obviously the one that you two were in was a great lineup <laughs> but, you know you what, what um, you know when I think back it's like that's one of the most special things that I, I've ever been part of really you know that that, that generate that um, that chapter of the falls history yeah. I remember things like, I remember being at the Tower Club in um, Oldham. Oh, at yeah. one, of the, one of those early gigs. And so I'm guessing it might have been late 77, early 78, around that time. Mm. And we're in the dressing room. It's before the fall had gone on stage. Well, that and, wasn't the Here and Now one, was it? It, it was. Yeah. Supporting Here and Now, yeah, the, the hippie yeah. band. Yeah. yeah. And I remember free, it. Free, free in then? Yeah. I, I can't remember. It's free, well, it's free for me because I was with the band. <laughs> 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 they only told you that, Clint. It was free for everyone. They were just trying to make yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> You're on the thinking, yeah. I'm blagged, <laughs> blagged it in here. But I remember Una had the, um, she had a bag of boiled sweets and she was going around everybody in the dressing room giving them these sweets out, you know, offering us sweets. I thought, that's nice. And I, I ate it off of Martin from day one. I always loved Martin. Yeah. Um, uh, Tony never really got to know because he was very quiet, very uh, introverted. One, you know, mm. to me, it seemed that way. Um, Carl was a bit too edgy for me, to be honest with you. He, he, put, Ooh, yeah. he, put, he put the shits up me a bit. In fact, he gave me a cigarette, but he, he stubbed his cigarette butt out on my hand one day, which I thought was really out of order on the back of my hand. Which he's only, he's only being friendly. It's just his way, you know. Is that his way of communicating? <laughs> but, uh, but I remember, yeah, I remember. It's the sign he liked you. You know, so, yeah, but, but yeah, it's, it's his way of bonding, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But, but I remember what, 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 what you're up, it means he loves you. You know what? So it's, it's, well, it's only dawned on me recently about the fall. In fact, it's only dawned on me since you asked me to do this that the fall, you know, throughout all those, is it 60 people that have been in the band in total or something? Yeah. Wow. The amount of gentle souls, most of those people, including the lads that were in the fall right at the end, whenever yeah, I've met great people, yeah. A lot of gentle souls like Una was and. Uh, Martin was, yeah, uh, and you know Riley was. You two are. It's just it, it, it's like did Mark deliberately sur- surround himself with these gentle souls that he could boss about? <laughs> no, he did have a knack of getting that sort of great people around him. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it created a great body of work, didn't it? Whatever the chemistry was, it it, it, it they maintained it through fucking decades. And yeah, well, it's I mean, incredible. Um, We've noticed that doing this podcast, everyone we spoke to has we've, we've been a delight, you know. I mean, yeah. including like Kieran from the last lineup, and I know Mark kind of. Um, I don't. I don't really know what he said about the earlier lineups. I, I don't think it was massively complimentary, but it's not something any of them took on board. They weren't like oh, ambassadors <laughs> from the early lineup. They didn't yeah. subscribe to that at all. They were great and re- really really oh. nice guy. I think. I think what probably happened we was... imagine like Mark in a hotel room slagging us off, and then that. Had, that had, uh, you know, colour their opinion of us, and yeah, it hasn't happened. Yeah, I, I think from what I can see, being as objective as I can, is that I think by the time you guys joined, there was a kind of um, understanding of the hierarchy, if I can use that word. Oh, without totally, yeah. Totally. Whereas at the beginning, I think there was a, there was a bit of a battle, wasn't there, between mm. a, it, it, was this a, a cooperative band, or was it Mark's band? And I think when he brought it was Kay Carroll, wasn't it, that he brought in to manage the band. Yeah, yeah. Was Kay his girlfriend at the time? Well, it, it gets a bit messy, I think, that. Right. Because there was Una, and then it's. Um, so, yes, I think so. I think she was his girlfriend before she was the manager. So, right. I, th- I think that that's sort of when I, I saw things shifting in terms of the, um, you know, the, 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 the power, maybe you like, of uh, the control. But I think after that, it became, you know, I mean, seeing people getting sacked and coming back in. Or leaving of their own accord, and then coming back, you know, repeated time. It just, it was obviously uh, a chemistry or an, a, a, an arrangement that worked, yeah. wasn't it? It, it? it was painful for some individuals, obviously, along the way, but it worked. If, you know, if, if the bottom line was making great albums, making great music, doing amazing gigs, it worked right up until the very end. You know, like even <laughs> the last lineup of the fall that I saw, but you know, with Kieran and the, the guy, it was, it was just stunning. The brilliant, it was beautiful, the brilliant you know, yeah. lineup, yeah. Yeah. So I was, I'll tell you what I was going to ask you. You're talking about um, the difference between The Fall and other bands and uh, and punk. Was, this, yeah. was it a direct influence on you in terms of keyboards? Because there weren't that many bands with keyboards, were there, then? And you ended up um, as a keyboard player. The Fall, right at the beginning, had the little electronic keyboard. So, yeah, I picked, picked up on that and I loved it. Um, I mean, before that, what was into? I mean, I was into 50s rock and roll. So, yeah, keyboard music wasn't a big thing for me until... You know the late seventies and through the eighties when I really started getting into the doors and stuff. But yeah, yeah that that early um, electric keyboard that the fall had that you need, 
Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And, and then, you know, when Mark Riley and the Creepers, that, that was like a brilliant keyboard band to me. And that was a massive influence on what I did with In Spirals. And I've, I've said that a lot yeah. over the years. Um, I was going to ask about that because that that's that kind of mass, Mark Riley's massive swelling organ, if you'll pardon the expression. Yeah, there's a there's a link there, isn't there? I think between that and the in spirals. Absolutely, and I've given Mark credit for it over the years. I mean, I think it directly influenced me. You know, when I started with in spirals, because I love the Creepers. I thought they were an amazing band as well. First time um, I met you was I was roadieing for the Creepers. Really. Oh yeah, you were married. Was it, was it to Chala Grid? You were managing a band, is that right? That's right. Yeah, to Chala Grid from Oldham. Yeah. Yeah, but very ahead of the curve in terms of title, Black Panther. I, I didn't even know what it meant at the time. It was the bass player, Chris, that had come up with the name, and I'd, um, he tried to explain to me a couple of times, but I'm like, I don't understand what he's on about here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was ahead of its game, wasn't it? Ahead of its time. Yeah, definitely, um, yeah. Going back to that, that keyboard thing and, and the influence of the fall on the Inspirals, you know that song, Joe? Yeah, yeah. When I wrote Joe, that was my sort of... I was very influenced by um, New Face in Hell. Ding 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 ding. That's it. So that, that was like Joe. Joe was definitely that. Right, we have noticed. Yeah, I, I might mention. I might mention the drum pattern at some point. But we'll, yeah, uh, get, get your people to talk to my people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, millions, but, um, yeah. Millions, millions here, Steve. What's what's that? We're talking millions in compensation here. Oh yeah. Yeah, I reckon. Yeah, millions. Well, we would be if I'd had a credit on New Face in Hell, but there you go, that's a different story. <laughs> I don't think I have either, have I? No, I don't know. No, but there's only so many people you can credit with two notes, really, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you another early memory of the fall, that's a Martin Brammer memory that I love, was, I mean, it was, he was so cool and iconic, wasn't he, the way he used to dress. And, yeah. and, and, and he was, like you were saying about Marker, yeah. but it, it's kind of like rock star that's not in any way kind of macho. Yeah, so if, quite feminine in, in a lot of ways. You know yeah. Uh, and I remember he used to, he had this big badge with a, just a, an eye, a close-up of an eye on it. I, I used to desire that badge. I used to, yeah. like, I wanted it. But, but it's one of his party tricks, it took him a while to pull it off, was during one particular song, and I can't remember which song it would be, but he'd be doing, a, like, a, a simple guitar solo. And he'd turn his back to the audience, and then he'd lean over backwards, so he'd be looking at the audience upside down. That was what he was trying to do, wow. if you can picture it. And the first few times he did it, he fell over every time. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then eventually, I, I should I should know what venue it was, but eventually he did it, and we were there, me and Karen and the others at the side of the stage, like, yeah, he did it, did it. <laughs> but yeah, I bet I've never discussed that with him, but I bet he'll remember it. It, it, it took a while to get that right, when, but when he mastered oh, it, it looks yeah, amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to Martin next week. I'll, I'll right, ask brilliant. Him about that. <laughs> ask him about that. So what, what? So when he perfected it, he stopped doing it, basically. <laughs> Probably, I probably moved on to something else or, or got sacked. <laughs> I think Martin left of his own accord. Did, did Martin leave? To, I was going to yeah. say, it's surprising the number of people, you get this reputation for sacking people, but the number of people who left as opposed yeah. to being sacked. Yeah, yeah. most you, people. Sometimes yeah. you could, you could uh, view it as constructive dismissal. You know, if, if, you, if your position becomes untenable yeah. and, you walk, and you walk before you push. Like, But I think most people, it was their decision. He didn't sack as many people as... No, i and there is that thing you said before, is that a lot of them, most of them wanted to go back. Yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing when you see that. It's, it's surprising how many did go back, You because it sounds like, you know, that that ended ugly, but then he's back here in the next year, you know, doing another album in the weather. So, yeah, there was something, there was an attraction, wasn't there? I mean, it was one of the greatest bands of all time, simple as that, and, uh, you know... I, I, That's it, yeah. I mean, you're not going to, you know... Present company accepted. He's one of the finest lyric writers, you know. There's ever there's ever gonna be, you know. And you, you, absolutely. Yeah. And he, he, I think he always thought that people left saying, "I can do better than this." I don't mm. think anybody did really. Maybe I, I can do different from this. I want to do a different kind of thing. Mm. But I don't think anybody thought I can write lyrics better than Marky e. Smith, who left the fall. I really don't believe that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's he, he was uh, one of a kind. The, yeah. I can't, I can't think of, I cannot think of another lyricist um, that's d- that did what he did. It no. was just uh, incredible and a joy to listen to. I think I read something recently. John Peel once said that Mark Smith had given more happiness over the years than any other individual, and I think, I think that's something that that, that a lot of us can relate to that. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, it, particular as a consumer of the music, like I am. You know, rather than somebody yeah. in the band, but. The amount of joy it gave me, you know, particularly through those first, you know, 14, 15 albums and then 
after that, I lost track a bit. I mean, I got I got tired of finding out what the new Fall album was. So uh, there, there's a point where you know I've not got the vinyl albums after a certain point. Yeah. But um, yeah, to me, I mean, through the uh, through the early '80s when I was uh, working in the furniture trade and just you know I had a van, a transit mm-hmm. van, and you know, my life would revolve around, you know, getting the next Fall album, put it on cassette right away, you know, immediately so I could listen to it wherever I went and just being obsessed with that music and, you know, just yeah. probably more than any other band, how, how obsessive I became about the Fall. I mean, I did it with The Doors as well a couple of years later, I think, when yeah, I think I got into The Doors pretty late. I wasn't into them in the 60s or 70s, but by, you know, the 80s, Three eighty four, eighty five. I was obsessed with the Doors, but before they that, kinda, the they kind of came back then, didn't they? The Doors. They kind of came back into vogue. I don't know. Was it um, <laughs> no one here gets out alive? Did that come out then? The documentary. Uh, that... Yeah, I think it did. There was a, a book, and then there was the the documentary. I don't. I think. I think for me, my trip that led me to the Doors was I'd started collecting all these um, machines. You know, some instruments, some yeah. machines, th- things that could make music or make noise. That started as soon as punk happened to me. So through you know the end of the seventies, the early eighties, I was collecting a lot of machines. And then by eighty two or eighty three, I was working in this uh, mill in Ashton. Um, and I managed to take over a lot of the unused rooms in the mill and I made uh, a little recording studio and rehearsal uh, studio. Um, and so it meant I could put all these machines out and start a little band. Me and Chris Goodwin and Manny, uh, who ended up in the Roses, yeah. we started a little band called The Mill at the end of 80, 83. Right. Uh, and we'd go down to the actual mill um, every Sunday and make music, record it all on cassettes, which I've still got. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, but it, and it was that, it was that, uh, me realizing that I had some keyboards, it was like 60s keyboards. And that's when I started researching bands like The Doors and, uh, you know, the 13 Floor Elevators and The Seeds. The and, Seeds, yeah. Yeah, d- these are the incredible 60s bands. So it, it, I sort of discovered that through the 80s, you know, because of my love of machines and sound, really. Yeah. Right. And the fact that, I mean, the first instrument I ever got to, to try and learn uh, was a bass guitar. That, that was my first instrument, and that would be about the time of punk. That would be um, 76. You probably mastered that in about five minutes, though, didn't you? So it's not yeah. Much point, it, it? I, you know what? It, it hurt my fingers, and <laughs> I, 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 I didn't stick at it. I, did, I think we had a six string in the house, like an a, a acoustic, uh, with, they used to call it cat, cat goat, you know, the plastic strings. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was like, I couldn't get my head around that. Six strings, five fingers, nah, it's not going to work. <laughs> so I think that's what led me to the bass. I thought I'd probably be able like smash this it's only four strings I've got five fingers on that hand and it hurt my fingers too much and so I mean ultimately I, I gradually moved around to the keyboard was the easiest thing for me to uh, get my head around really so I think that's how I ended up uh, as a keyboard player um, because it's simple and you know because of bands like The Fall and The Creepers by the yeah. time I joined the Spirals you could play those nursery rhyme melodies and it was enough do you know what I'm saying? Yeah I do but I, thought, you- I thought you were like you'd have been Piano lessons as a kid. Look, looking at you, you, you know, you're used, you're used two hands for a start. So you know, you play yeah. properly, aren't you? I don't do much with my left hand. My left hand's mainly chords or simple bass lines. But um, I think I've got a rhythmic style that um, I've developed over the years. So a lot of the time, it's you know, there's a lot of rhythm to what I'm doing, yeah. uh, rather than scale work. I don't really do scales when I'm playing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got a, I've got a style that people recognise, but I still don't consider myself to be a great keyboard player. And I've, I've really neglected me playing over the last. I've hardly played since Craig died. Our drummer, I've hardly played yeah. at all. To be honest, I'm, I'm still making music, but I'm not really um, pushing myself as a keyboard player. I, I, I see myself more as a singer and a composer, right. really, than a keyboard right. player. So, but yeah, it's, uh, I ended up with these uh, amazing machines. I've got I've still got the the Far Fees, the Compact Duo that played all the Inspirals records and gigs. You still work. Uh, yeah, it's still working. I don't use it much now, obviously, but it's still uh, been, you know, good nick. It still works fine. It's all flight case. The, the little Dalek sandbag that sticks out the bottom, the little box, have you still got that as well? Uh, what's that, sorry? The... Well, Kelly had one, and it had this little, little, like I say, it looked like a Dalek sandbag, and you plugged it in the yeah. key, but it sat underneath it. A power pack, yeah. I'm looking at one here now. Yeah, the far fees. <laughs> it's, uh, it's got a spring reverb inside it as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I've still got like that. Leslie kind of thing, kind of. Uh, yeah, you, you, I mean, I didn't use a Leslie. The Leslie speaker was, uh, I've got one, but I never used it with the band. It's always a bit too cumbersome. But um, yeah, the, the good thing with the far fees, the, the vibrato in it was just beautiful. It was like, because yeah. it's a transistor instrument and it had this real shrill sort of sound similar to the Creepers. I don't know what Mark used to use. But... I've got that here. I've got, my, I've got my little reference book here and he had a CRB Ele- Electronica Diamond 600. That's what he had. 
Right, so similar sort of thing, a tr- transistor instrument. Um, rather than a valve, you know, like the Ammons were valve based, if, if I remember rightly, and they, were, they had a more of a soft sound, you know, whereas yeah. we were like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, hey, bloody hell, he did it, but his mouth he never played a keyboard. Yeah. So that was the exact sound that was. That's why, that, that's, what, that's, what, that's what I should be doing, making noises with my mouth. We were searching for that sound with the lovers for 10 years. <laughs> 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 yeah, it still sounds now like it yeah. <laughs> yeah so speaking of that well what i need we need to ask you about of course is i want you let's go yeah, yeah. Because amazing whose idea was that to get mark in then was that yours i think so i mean it was certainly me that got told to make the phone call <laughs> 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 so how, how that came about you probably remember about the um in the early 90s the big thing for a band was, well, the, the way you did it, you'd record your album, 11 songs, and you were going to record, you are going to release three or four singles from it. So, and the singles back then, to really cane the formats and sell as many units as you could, you'd do a remix. So you'd, yeah. you'd release, this is how it feels. Oh, we on didn't seven. know anything about that with Hit the North. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, did, did it happen with Hit the North? There's about 25 remixes. Yeah. yeah. So that's the way it was. What was that? Was that eight, eight, 85? 80. Yeah. So a bit later than that one. 86. 86. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's what, yeah. what bands did. You, you know, yeah. I mean, on the advice of the record label, you release the single uh, on three formats. It'd be a 7-inch, 12-inch cassette. Mm. And then you'd release a remix the week after. Uh, you know, there'd be remixed by somebody on our label, Mute Records. It might, it might be, you know, somebody out of Depeche Mode remix. And then that would come out on 7-inch, 12-inch and cassette. So you'd have all these... Um, Four bats. It was it was normal to do it, but I always I think we always found it a bit. But it's a bit, a bit distasteful, really. Yeah, it? distasteful, a bit brutal Trying to get the same people to buy it over and over again. Yeah, and nice. also the the quality of some of the remixes was was shite. I mean, some of them are brilliant. You know, there's some. Oh, there's some of them that none. The, the, some of them hit the North remixes that none of the band are on. Yeah, absolutely. We had that. I mean, the best one we had was, um, I think it was "She Comes in the Fall," the single where. One of the remixes that we had done through the record company was done by Rebel MC, right? Oh, yeah. Remember that? He had a big hit record. I can't remember what it's called. Ding, 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 ding. So this, this remix comes back and we're all sat there in the office in Manchester, we put it on, play it. And it was like, is that? Ding, 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 ding. She comes in the fall. It was like, are you joking? He wants three grand. Well, that, that, anyway, so, so we went through that, that era. You know, we, we played the game. We did all that. But by the time we um, we had that album, what, what album was I Want You on? Was that the last, was it Revenge of the Goldfish? Was it was, yeah. yeah. Or it might have been Devil Up. Anyway, whatever album it was. <laughs> um, we, we, we decided that the singles that we're going to release from it, rather than just doing remixes, we'd do some collaborations with other artists that we could use in, instead of remixes, you know? So yeah. we, we did one with Peter Hook. Peter Hook did a, a track with us. In fact, we called it Theme from Developing. So it was the Developing album period. Right. Hook, uh, did that. We did a track with Basil Clark that was brilliant. The guy uh, from Yargo. Yeah, I, I Don't Want to Go Blind was the name of the track. So we had our version on the album, and then we had a version with Basil singing it. Uh, and somehow we came up with the idea of approaching Smithy to do uh, <laughs> a track or two tracks. Um, I can't remember whether I suggested it, but I knew Mark. I'd, 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 you know, I'd bumped into him a lot of times around uh, Manchester. He was in the same building, I think, at one point. I think, did the fall have an office in... We did. In New yeah. Mount Street, was it? Yeah. So I'd see Mark, and yeah, he was always... in New Mount Street, weren't you? Yeah. yeah, and he was always dead complimentary, because I'd seen, you know, you'd see him in the papers slagging everybody in the world off, and particularly musicians, and... Um, he, he was the one that, one of my favourite Mark stories was when he was in the enemy office at some point and he saw a picture of the Verve yeah. on, the, on, on somebody's desk and it was before the Verve were established and he looked at this picture and he said, I hope we never have a war. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great one with Swade where Swade was supporting him and uh, <clears throat> he came on and they didn't think they were going to get a sound check and Mark came out and said, no, oh, give these lads a sound check. They sound really good, these. And he stood there and he watched the sound check and then he, he was interviewed uh, the same day on the radio and they said, oh, what do you think of Swade? And said, Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> anyway, so I'd, I'd bump into him and he was always dead complimentary and I think because he recognised we're a, you know, a 60s influence garage band, yeah. 
he, he saw the seeds in what we were doing and he saw the uh, question mark and the mysterious and all these bands that he'd really appreciate. So he was always dead complimentary. He'd always give me the time of day. Uh, how's that band he was going for? Are you doing all right? Yeah, look all right. You know, you should, uh, yeah, you, should do, you should do it for a living, you know. You <laughs> might make some money out of that if you keep doing it. And, and, and so he was always dead complimentary. So we decided we were going to ask him to do um, some collaborative work with us on this album. And I phoned him up and he was in an hotel somewhere. I can't remember where, where it was, but... I phoned him and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Send me, send me the album, I'll listen to it. And uh, we sent it to him and he picked two tracks. He said, I'll do Saturn Five and I Want You. And we're like, fucking hell, brilliant. This is it. So I, was, right. I mean, the Saturn Five version didn't come out until a few years ago. We released it as a, a special edition on some yeah. great... Yeah, it's, it's pretty good, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. But the, the, the I Want You... Um, we ended up putting out as a single and uh, subsequently doing Top of the Pops and uh, yeah. all this. Get, and that, we're going to have to get Steve <laughs> on that. He's, he's got over it now, but the, the only time Mark East Whipper's on Top of the Pops with, with the Inspiral Carpets. And was, Absolutely, yeah. It was funny because that, that period was... I mentioned to Paul the other day when I was talking that um, I only spent a, a matter of days working with Mark, um, but I feel like I could write a book about it. So yeah. for you guys, for you guys that were in there for you know fucking uh, uh, years and years, I mean, you were. Yeah, I've written a book about. <laughs> <laughs> you have, yeah. but it's like so. But it's so intense and colourful, fucking very colourful, but very intense and frightening at some moments, you know. But that that period of doing the recording which we did at Par Street, um, Top of the Pops, you know, the trip to London to Top of the Pops, the press days that we did with it, photo shoots, video shoots, all that 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 era. Me working that closely with him, you know, to me was like fucking hell. This was the guy that, when I first saw him at the circus in um, seven, uh, at seventy seven, the, the last night at the Electric Circus, he, he knocked Elvis Presley off my the plinth of you know my favorite wow. pop star yeah. became Mark Smith. So I was that obsessive about the fall back then. If I'd have ever known, if I'd have, if I if somebody had told me you're going to end up doing fucking top of the pops with him, yeah. <laughs> recording with him, being his mate, you know, it's like I wouldn't have believed it and. Um, and there we were. Uh, but the top of the top trip. Well, I think it was Graham who said it, wasn't it? About how, what a great job Tom did on that top, top of the pops. Because yeah. he was singing live and Mark was just coming in whenever he felt like it. Yeah, and it changed every time. I mean, through the course of the day, when we were doing the run-throughs, the camera run-throughs that you do, because you, you go through it like six or seven times through the course of the afternoon, and it's so that the cameraman can practice where they're going to, you know, film yeah, at yeah. each moment. And they look shit close up to the... bass player look, when it's a guitar solo. I was going to say exactly that. He used to piss <laughs> me off that. It's like you're watching Top of the Pops, and like, hang on, I'm doing my fucking guitar solo, and you, you're seeing Craig's bass drum here. What's, <laughs> what about Sorry, keyboard solo. And, anyway, so they did all this, and so the... the 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 cameramen and crew were very precious about this has got to be right. This has got it's like military precision, and then you bring somebody like Mark Smith into the uh, yeah. equation. So Mark was doing it differently every run through through the afternoon. He'd be in a different part of the stage. He'd be singing different words. He'd be, you know, one minute he'd have his arm around Tom, and the next minute he'd be stood behind the drums, or whatever, like he does, and fiddling with amps like that annoying thing that he used to do. <laughs> but um, Sli- slightly less annoying when you're miming. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, probably. But um, carry on, Mark. So yeah, we'll come back to Top of the Pops in a minute. So when he did that, right? When he played with, like, I'm assuming Steve that he met, messed with your bass amp, did he, while you were playing? Uh, I think I, I'm going to say I was probably the first person he ever did it to. Right, and did he actually do anything? Or was he just like? Yeah, he did. Yeah, I was, did he? was in this gig in Australia, and we had a big row about it afterwards. Right. And then he just carried on doing it. Well, no, from that, if you see me from then on, I'm stood in right in front of me, bass amp. So he can't get to it. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a revelation. I'll start with that. <laughs> Simon was saying they had a fake bass drum mic. Yeah. So that he right. could pull that out and launch it across the stage, and they'd still have a bass drum mic. The real one would still be in there. Oh, so a bit of, bit of theatre. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, he didn't know. He thought it was real. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, it's, anyway, back to the top of the pop. So it, it was through the afternoon, he's causing havoc. And then we got a call. Me and Graham got called by our plugger uh, but before the, the live run through. Um, and we got called to the side of the, there's like a little uh, alleyway behind the studio, like a fire escape and an alleyway. And we stood there, me, Graham, Nikki, Kefala, our plugger. 
and the producer of Top of the Pops at the time, I'm not going to name him now because it's, it's led to disagreements in the past, this, but uh, <laughs> you said you're going to have to send Mark home. We, we're not, we don't want you to do this with Mark. He's causing too much friction in the crew. And we're like, you what? You, we, we're doing it with Mark or we're not doing it. The, the previous visit to Top of the Pops, whatever single that was, when we told them we were thinking of putting the track with Mark out as a single, the Top of the Pops producer was like, you've got to get him on Top of the Pops. You've got to get him on Top of the Pops. And we're like, you sure? Yeah, you've got... And we did. We got him down there and then they are telling us to get rid of him. Blimey. So it's like, we we dug our heels and we said, that if, you know, if Mark's not doing it, we're not doing it. Simple as that. Anyway, we did it um, and it was beautiful. It was spectacular. In, in terms of Top of the Pops history for, you know, yeah, thousands yeah. of people like us that, that appreciate, you know, good music. That was a, an absolute highlight on top of that, wasn't it? Oh, um, yeah. But going down to do the live, you've probably heard this story, going down from the green room or the dressing room to the studio to film the live uh, performance. Um, I don't Mark, he, he, you know, he used to get himself really wound up into a weird, uh, a weird character before he went on stage a lot of time, didn't he? He'd be like... Mm locking himself away in, in toilets and, you know, just really getting in. I don't know whether it's part of his routine, but he did this at Top of the Pops and he ended up in a really weird mood as we're walking down to do it. Um, and he stopped me on the stairs, me and him walking down side by side and he stopped me on the stairs. And he said, Clint, look at me, look at me. Are you all right? I'm, I'm fine. He said, look at me, look at me. And he slapped me across the face. So oh, I slapped him back. I just slapped him back. And then he slapped me. We were like slapping each other, like maybe <laughs> fucking Laurel and Hardy or something. And then, <laughs> and then he stubbed his... Um, he stubbed his cigarette out on my, my shirt. I had a real beautiful denim shirt with an Harley Davidson bike embroidered across the front. And he stubbed it out right on the cylinder head of the embroidery. Uh, he I still could, got... he could, bloody hell, it could have blown up. Like... Yay! Yeah. <laughs> but it was only a, a piece of clothing. <laughs> no, but he did, he did that. In fact, I think he did that before the slapping started. Anyway, but either way, we're there on the, st- on the stairs on our way to this live, you know, this iconic live performance. And me and me, all-time musical hero, are slapping each other. Wow. Slapping fuck out of each other's faces. It's like, what's, what's going on? Anyway, the rest of the band like, sort of broke it up and it, you know, it, it moved on. Um, no malice whatsoever. We got on stage and it was brilliant. And he was, he was, I think as part of his ad-libbed rant on, on the performance, he's talking about me and the, uh, the rant. Yes, 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 I saw that. He yeah. said something about you, didn't he? It's like, and there's Clint and he's in love. Oh, yeah. I want you back. Uh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, it, was, it just, that, that weird moment of slapping. I mean, you know what? It wasn't like, we weren't trying to kill each other or hurt each other. It was just grown blokes who should know better, slapping each other. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? And, and, yeah, and, I do. I've so experienced, yeah. experienced that myself, to be honest. Yeah. That's a yeah. different story. So but, there's, um, there's, a, there's a great bit in the video where he says, uh, the inspired of Calvary, so trying to be like the seeds, but no one's ever heard of them either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he told a joke as well about, um, we had to cut it out of the video, but he did um, a joke about, and I think it was about a, a plane load of Americans crashing or something. It was like, it was a bit dark, so we took that out because we thought we don't want to end yeah, up yeah, with yeah. Uh, anything that controversial happening. But um, yeah, just every, every day with him was... Uh, like that, as you know, and I don't know how, how you did that for years, year after year after year. I don't know, but um, yeah, c- c- well done. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> to you both. You win. It only, it only took him five years to get over it. <laughs> yeah, I did. A, he, he, he did something mid later on in life, which was totally spontaneous and, uh, you know, again, equally as brilliant for me as a moment in my, my career. So I had a band called the Clint Boone Experience. Yeah, you, I was going to ask about that, yeah. Yeah, and we did. Um, I was doing a gig in London. I can't remember the venue, but um, we came off stage, if I remember rightly, and my manager, Spike, said, oh, Mark Smith's out here. He wants to come and say hello to you. This is before we did the encore. And he brought him in. He brought him into the dressing room. I had a little catch up. He said, fucking great to see you, Clint. And uh, he said, uh, do you want to... Do you want me to come on stage and do anything with you? He, he offered it to us, and wow. I said, "Well, that'd be fucking brilliant, I, you know." But I don't know what we could do. Could not rehearse that. I said, "We always finish our set. We always do the encore. I want to be your dog by the Stooges." And he said, oh, "I'll do that. Oh, let's do that then. Come on, let's do that. Let's get on. Come on." And he just he, we just did this, and it was recorded. You know, we, we yeah. had a nice recording of it, and it totally had, had lib. Uh, sorry, totally you know spontaneous, uh, unrehearsed, and it was brilliant. And well, uh, it's re- you released that, didn't you? I think. It came out as a B-side of right. a single, and it is, it's is—it's on YouTube. It's actually on yeah. YouTube. But again, for me, you know, as one of my favourite moments in my career and, and life, that, that'd that be it, you know, him, him getting up, doing that unannounced, yeah. unpracticed. It just, um, so, yeah, I, was, I mean, that... I was going to ask about that album. It's, it, that album's got Mark 
Fran Ely out of um, Travis. Travis. Yeah. And Alfie Ball, that's right, Al- isn't it? Alfie Ball, the opera singer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so quite, that's quite a line up, isn't it? Yeah, that, that Alfie chapter was nice. That was um, when the Inspirals had split. We split in uh, spring 95, and I started working on a lot of other projects, including solo music. And during that time, I met this unknown opera singer from Fleetwood, um, and we decided to do some work together because I was really into doing... I think when it came out of the Inspirals then, my mindset was I want to do stuff that I couldn't have done in the Inspirals. Yeah. So it's like it's un- unbridled, unbridled and, you know, no boundaries. Um and that was what the Clint Moon experience was. It was like, a, in, in a lot of ways, it was just this mad cabaret band at a time when people weren't doing stuff like that. You know, it was a, it was a mad show. You know, we had like a guy, guy playing tuba on stage. We had cab, a life-size, life-size cardboard cut out of me, uh, left over from the Inspirals photo shoots and uh, had a reindeer's head on the front of the Far Fisa. It still had the bullet hole in its head where it had been killed by a hunter or whatever. It was like, this all <laughs> bizarre Bizarre stuff going on. Not that I condoned that hunting, but it was my mum, mum and dad's uh, reindeer. They, uh, yeah. they had it on the, the lounge wall like you did in the 1970s. <laughs> and they give it me, and so I can put it on my organ because it's a cabaret band. <laughs> so it's all this mad stuff. Anyway, but yeah, Alfie Bo, uh, this opera singer, I got him over to my studio in my house in Rochdale. Um, and as I said, he was unknown at the time. He'd just finished working for TVR, which is where he was spraying cars for a living. Uh, and he was about to go off to study opera at, right. at the college, in the opera right. college. Um and we recorded a load of stuff in my house, which became, it, it was spread out over the two Clint Boone Experience albums. Um, and he's just got such an amazing voice. Even back then, you knew that this yeah. guy was special, you know, for, for a young chap to have a voice like that. And uh, yeah, he did gigs with us when he was available. He'd come and get on stage and do the songs with us. And we always dressed him up in, in an evening suit and put sunglasses on him. And we, call, <laughs> we, called, him, we called him Opera Dude. That, that was his name on stage. And we'd welcome him. And he just went down a tree. Every time he did it, it was just amazing, you know. And then the gigs that Alfie couldn't do, we had a girl called Sarah uh, Cluderay that was, uh, she was opera chick, so she became wow. our opera, opera singer later on. But yeah, that was um, a, a nice, uh, that that chapter of being just able to do whatever I wanted, you know, all these mad ideas without having yeah. to sell, sell the ideas to my mates in these spirals. Yeah. Just get it out of my system while I could, and, and I did, and it led to some really lovely collaborations. I mean, the, the thing with Fran Ela was beautiful. and Yeah. Yeah, just dead lucky that I could... Um, keep that live music thing going and that recording music thing going because it was an hard time that 95 96 yeah. for me i was on my arse i was signing on for the first part of that period because i you know i had i think my second child had just been born at that point and um you know all the money that the inspirals had made through the the, the glory years as tom yeah. calls it was sort of running out you know we all had big mortgages and you know uh, some of us had fancy cars and all that bullshit yeah. um so the money was running out and i had kids to feed and a mortgage to pay and it was you know, for me, fortunately, we would lived in a country where I was able to get help with my mortgage yeah. and, you know, the income support to help me with the kids and all that. So I made the most of that, and you know, while I needed it. Um, but during that time, I made some of my best work, I think, you know, creatively. Yeah. Some of those the songs that I wrote for the Clint Boone experience is definitely some of my best work, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was during that time that I got the call from Mark, wasn't it, where he asked me to join the fall, which is... So, a, what, yeah, let's find that, for what year would that have been? What year are we talking about? <laughs> It'd either be late 95 or early 96. I've still got the micro cassette somewhere with the message on it. Right. So you were but, still in the band then, Steve? But I was still in the band then, yeah. Right. I'm, 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 since so we said that, I've been trying to see if, if, if I it, recollect being, you know, uh, asked about it or consulted. I think it was before Julia joined, wasn't it? So when did Julia join? Can you remember that? Yeah, that was probably, yeah, late 95. Yeah, so before that, then he called me. So I was well, his first, I was his first choice. <laughs> no, was it? I, I think it was, was. Was it not before? Ju- I th- I've, I've got a feeling he either asked me before Julie joined or just after. But I've got a feeling it might have been just before. Um. Right. Anyway, he left me a message uh, on my answer form, and it was, uh, uh, Clint, I need a new uh, uh, keyboard player for the fall, and uh, I, I think you're the man for it. So give us a call, and we'll sort it out. You know, I like just assuming I was going to snap his hand off, which yeah. Part of me wanted to. Anyway, I phoned him back and I said, I'm, 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 you know, I'm flattered, Mark, but I'm just really busy at the moment. I've just got so much on. Um, and I, I, yeah, I could have done it. I, li- I, I told the man a lie, but it was only because having seen how uncomfortable working with him could be at some points. I, I think I didn't, you made I, the right decision. Probably. Yeah, I, did, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to join a band, you know, and, you know, have a great year with him or two years with, with you um, and then fall out with him. You know, it's, it's one of them, it's, it's my, my hero, my musical hero, one of them, you know, along, alongside people like Elvis and Philip Glass. You know, Smith was up there with them. And I just thought, I, I don't want to be fighting with him. I don't want him unplugging my keyboard during the gig. I don't want him 
slapping me. You know, it's like I just I'd rather keep it that we were mates and you know we collaborate yeah. occasionally, hopefully. Um, and I, I, I told him I just said I can't do it, and I told him a white lie, but it's probably I think we probably did each of us a favor yeah. by doing that. He said wow. that as well. Ed Blaney, he did the same thing. He because he worked he worked with Mark off and on for years, and he always made it a thing that he was never going to join the fall because he knew it had changed the relationship. You know, really, yeah. And yeah. Ed, Ed was never actually in the fall, was he? I don't no, think he wasn't. Right. No, right. I mean, he, like, and so he was. He was mates with Mark right to yeah. the end. So you, right it, the end, yeah. it changes the relationship, doesn't it? You know, not 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 saying that's necessarily Mark's fault or anybody else's, but it does. It's different, isn't it? Well, yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It is, it is tough to balance that. Somebody who's your friend and your boss, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, um, and I think I just I recognise that as extreme as Mark. Yeah, part of me, you know, part of me wishes I could have had that parallel life where I could have done it and tasted it and been on some of those amazing records. Um, but yeah, I think I made the right. But you know, bear in mind that there probably is only this one life that we get. That I think I did the right thing, really. I think probably, especially then. I think especially around ninety five. Yeah, then if it had been yeah. earlier or, or later, it might have been. Yeah, I might, yeah, but at that time, I don't. I think you did the right thing. Yeah, I like it as well that we we remained good friends, and you know, there was a lot of mutual respect right up until the last time I saw him, which was we did a gig in uh, in Italy. There was a festival out in Italy. I, th- I think it was twenty fourteen. We did it, um, and we were the headline act. And I've said this before in interviews that we, when we arrived at the gig, because I wasn't sure where we were playing and who was on the bill. And it was the Buzzcocks opening up, and then it was the Fall, and then it was us in Spirals. And I remember saying something, that, that poster's upside down, surely. It should be the other way up. <laughs> you know, because in my, in my mind, it's like, without those two support bands, you wouldn't that headline band wouldn't have existed. It was as simple as that. Um, and it was a brilliant occasion to be at, and we've got some real nice photographs. Um, I'm not getting pictures of me and Mark at that event, but me and, like, Pete Shelley was another one of my heroes, you know. Yeah, mine too, yeah. Yeah, and, and I remember I've I've met Pete a few times over the years, but nothing, you know, we never became close friends or spent any quality time together, but it was always a hero. I remember getting off the plane at the airport in, um, it was near Venice, this festival, and as we got our bags and walked through to the uh, arrivals lounge, and Pete Shelley was, there was a man there stood there with a clipboard saying in spiral carpets, and then Pete Shelley popped out and, Hello, Clint, how are you doing? I'm like, fucking hell, another one of my musical heroes here, just fucking letting on to me. And then me and him sat side by side in this minibus going to the, the hotel, just tell it, just getting all these stories out of him about the past and, you know, just yeah. like getting him to reminisce. And it just, but anyway, I met Mark at that gig. So we arrived on site. Um, um, the dressing rooms were, it was like an outside gig in the middle of a town, and the dressing rooms were in some civic building, or whatever. Um, and I think just before Buscox came on, Mark arrived in the dressing rooms and I went in to see him and we're having a chat. And um, he, he said, so he was, on, he, was on, he was playing. And I said, well, Buscox are about to come on stage now and then it's you. Like, so, oh, I like Buscox. Let's go and watch them. And so so he, <laughs> we're going out to watch this band like 30 yards from where we're standing. So he picks up all his carrier bags and walks out. <laughs> like, but, but we just stood watching Buscox. It was just like, it just, it was like so... Um, What's the word? Lucid and you know, yeah. funny, charming. It was just—I think it's probably the best I've ever, ever seen him over the years. And brilliant. Uh, we watched the Buzzcocks together, and that was the last time I saw him that night. Right. Um, so I, I like it that my last memory of him is that. Definitely, um, yeah. That, rather than one, yeah. you know, many many years ago, I can't remember where he was. It was some some party, some like fall launch party that I'd been invited to as his mate, and I went over to see him. So you having a good night, but Mark, everything all right? Like, Clint, fuck off. You know what I mean? That, that's how he could be, isn't it? Just yeah, to, yeah, no, no, yeah. no reason whatsoever. He'd, he'd just, you know, completely blow you out, which he did that night. And that, I would think that's the only time I can remember him being um, nasty to me, apart from the slapping incident at the top, which wasn't, wasn't even that nasty. It was just yeah, too much. I mean, he was slapping you in a kind way there, wasn't he? Let's face it. Yeah, yeah. The, the top of the post one was. I think in his mind, slapping me was probably getting me to wake up, get on, you know, get, yeah. get, get my senses. He was probably thinking, that's psyching me up, but. It was actually it, it, it's just bizarre, bizarre, <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> Don't make it okay, but you know, no, kind of explained not. it. So yeah. I was going to ask you about these spirals because obviously you got back together and then to tra- tragic reasons you kind of you had to knock it on the head. So what's where are things with the spirals these days then? Uh, we're still we're still a business. We're still doing stuff. Um, you know, all the time there's stuff going on to do with like reissuing records or uh, you know, it, such a body wants to use this. Uh, track mm-hmm. on a compilation album so the, the conversations there were very much a business we've not decided to split up or anything that discussion hasn't happened but since craig died there's just not been any talk whatsoever about getting back out there and doing it live yeah um 
I'm, I'm sure that at some point that discussion or that conversation will happen, uh, but it's not happening yet. Right. Uh, now, having said all that, tonight, you know, this uh, the night that we're recording this, we're actually doing a Tim's Twitter listening oh, yeah, party. Yeah, yeah, you're doing, um, you're doing, you're doing two, aren't you? Yeah, we're doing two. We're doing one tonight yeah. and then one next Wednesday. Uh, we're, and we're doing the albums that came out in uh, 92 and 93. So tonight is uh, Revenge of the Goldfish and next week is Developing. So y- y- it, when you do these things, you know, traditionally it creates a lot of love and positivity yeah. about yes. the, the band yeah, and the record. Know, yeah. So I think it'll be a, as a result of something like what's happening tonight. Somebody might just say, who fancies doing something live? Um, and it might happen. Now, for me personally, when that decision is made, it's a lot of work for me because it's, like it's months of sorting out the equipment again because it's a lot of keyboards, yeah, uh, yeah. Techn- technology and stuff. And then you've got the, the, you know, the endless rehearsal, trying to remember the song. So it's, it's a big process for me to say yes yeah, I'm ready to do yeah. and at the moment I've got so many other things on in me me uh, schedule that I, 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 I'm not I'm not ready for it yet. I feel like if I'm going to do it with the Inspirals, I need to say yeah. right, all right, let's start working on it in six months' time so yeah. I can clear the decks. And yeah. so yeah, I, I've not discounted ever doing it again. Would you all feel all right about doing it if you don't mind me? Asking, do you think? It's hard for me to say, isn't it? You know what? I mean, in my in my ideal, I'm very Mister Positive and you know mm-hmm. idyllic in me me outlook. I'd, I'd say let's do it with you know everybody Steve and Tom let's get both right. singers involved you know what I mean right. it's like that that'd be my take on it that might get blown out of the water as soon yeah. as I suggested it but that, that, that to me I think there'd be a, it'd be a beautiful um, way to you know let, it's a shame if the last chapter is the one that ended with Craig dying yes I'd definitely. love it if the, I'd love it if the last chapter was us celebrating the complete you know the, get some of the other members in that have helped us over the years and yeah. you know it definitely Tom right. is still a massive part of it. So whether that'll happen, I don't know. It might like might not ever yeah. <laughs> just might not have a chance in hell of happening. But uh, you know, in my mind, I'm, I'm still thinking along those terms yeah. that there, something should happen at some point. Yeah. You were gonna ask something about uh, uh in Sparrows, weren't you, Steve? <laughs> oh yeah, was, you know we, you know we played with Tom for ten years. Yeah. And I, so how did you <clears> feel about us playing in Spiral songs? I, I was I was jealous of the fact that he had two of the fall in his band. I thought, <laughs> how, how the fuck has he done that? <laughs> no, I don't know that myself. You know what? It's like I've never had a problem with that, mate. I've never had a problem oh, with um, Tom doing our songs. I've never had a problem with like I do a lot of work with tribute bands. You've probably seen that. I do a lot of yeah. DJing yeah, at yeah, tribute yeah, band yeah, events, yeah. and yeah. I've never had a problem with that really because it's a case of celebrating great songs and great bands. Mm. Often, no, we used to really enjoy playing them songs, didn't we? Oh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. I mean, we did that tour where we did the complete Beast Inside. Yeah, that's great. That's a great album. It's isn't it. It's a funny album, yeah. like it's like it still get when when I, I've been looking through old press recently because as, as part of trying to sort my house out with all this stuff that I've got hoarded, I've been going through old copies of Enemy and Melody Maker and Sounds, and where I've saved a full copy of the paper. You know, for just a little live review, I've started just cutting out the bits that are relevant and yeah. getting the rest. So I've been reading through some of the old press that we have got. And it's funny how cruel the press were about us, uh, particularly during that Beast Inside period. Right. Because b- before that, um, we were we were never considered to be as cool as the rest no, of Manchester you got a bit scene. Of a tough ride, really. Didn't yeah, you? we did. We did that Manchester thing. Yeah, but we did, we had the hits early on that they couldn't yeah. they couldn't um, ignore that, and the, the, so we got some good press in the early for the first album live. But with Beast Inside, when I'm reading back now some of the reviews for it, and they, they hated us, and they hated that album. And a lot of people talked about it as being a flop. I've seen um, like some of the faxes that we used to get sent to the office about the follow-up album to Beast Inside, which was Revenge of the Goldfish. Yeah. Um, and people talking really negatively within the industry about, uh, we, we're hoping this album's going to uh, be better after uh, the, the Beast Inside episode. Da, 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 da. Beast Inside got to number five in the album charts in the yeah. UK. It got to number five. It sold a lot of copies around the world. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, and it's like, um, in terms of how kind history has been to it, you couldn't have a better fairy tale because people recognise now what a, what a uh, not not a genius bit of work, but what a, a incredibly mature piece of work that was. That record, you know, for a band at that yeah. stage of its career, we, we often said ourselves we joked about the fact that we probably made our fifth album. Um, a bit early, you know. I mean? <laughs> our second album probably should have been our fifth album, but um, yeah, it's a great album, Beast and Sun. I'm dead proud it's, of it. It's a proper album as well, isn't it? You know, because like yeah. I said, we played the whole thing in, you know, uh, in the in the in the order it come, it's on, and it's a proper, 
piece. Of, it's not just like ten songs. It's an album, isn't it? It's a proper yeah, album. Yeah, totally, yeah. And it's an album that's not scared of. Um, we, you know, we weren't thinking singles here. We were just we were writing these monumental tracks that were just yeah. that couldn't have been singles, but they were just uh, you know as part of an album. It's a, it's a really nice journey, I think, when you listen yeah, to it. Definitely. Um, and we we did we reissued uh, Beast Inside recently. And we we included one extra track, um, which was Niagara, not Niagara. Um, it was something that we'd, we'd only released as a, a B side originally. Right, because Niagara's remember. on the album, isn't it? No, Niagara's on the on album. The album. But the, it, we've, we've put, put, stuck another tune in before it because this tune that we recorded is a B-side. As we finished the recording, as I finished recording the keyboards, I started playing um, the keyboard line for a new idea we were working on, which became Niagara, if I remember rightly. So we uh, we put this track in position, like in the position on the album where it would have been if we'd have included it in the, uh, right. the first line. Um, I should know the title of the track. But <laughs> well, yeah, great, great album. And uh, the, the, the closing track... Um, Dreams are all we have. Yeah, on Beast Inside was recorded after we did all the recording down at um, it might have been Jacob's studio in London, uh, down south. I think it was right. Jacob. Um, but we came back to Strawberry to mix it all with um, uh, Nagel, um, yeah. Chris Nagel, Chris, Chris Nagel. Nagel. Yeah, I, yeah, I got my Nagels mixed up then. I was going to say <laughs> <Julie>. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and uh, just the, I, I had all my keyboards set up in the studio. I just, I'd just been playing this tune, this mad instrumental. It was like very much influenced by Twin Peaks and you know that that Angelo Badalamenti music. Yeah, yeah. I've got and to say, did, it sounds like it's the soundtrack to a film that never came out. Yeah. You know? mm. Well, we recorded it. It's a live take. I set all my keyboards up Rick Wakeman style. I'm not. I'd never compare myself to Rick Wakeman, but that, that was how it was. It was a lot of keyboards. And I just played it all in one uh, one take. Really? Um, and we record, yeah, recorded it. It's still, still onto multi track, you know, all the different yeah. sounds. And then I think we added a bit of drums, maybe timpani or something over the, the end of it, towards the end. But um, yeah, that was recorded totally in Strawberry Studios, that track. Wow. Where, where the, I think before that, we'd never recorded a complete track in Strawberry. We'd just done bits of tracking and uh, mixing in there. But yeah, it's funny. It's. Um, it's. It, I, I, drive, I live in Stockport. I drive past Strawberry most days, and I still reminisce not just about the music we made in there, but the uh, you know some of the Jesus. iconic stuff. I can, I can yeah. give you three hours on Strawberry and how important yeah. it is. But um, you know, I did the other day. There's proper train spot, all right? So we all know the story about um, Martin Annett using the the lift shaft uh, yeah. to create the reverb on Joy Division's early recordings. Yeah. So the the other day, and I knew I've I've known this for years since you know when we used to work there. I'd know about this lift shaft, but I've never gone looking for the lift shaft. And the other day, what about three weeks ago, uh, on my way through Stockport, I drove around the back of Strawberry, got out of my car, and just looked at the lift shaft and photographed it. You can see wow. it from the back back street. Yeah. You, and you're just looking at this, the biggest echo chamber ever made, and it's like. Well, not I the mean, biggest, but the most important. It's just there to, to be seen, and it needs a blue plaque on the back of the studio, I think, as yeah, well. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> well, have, have you ever done the uh, the Motown tour in, in Detroit? You know, because it's just a house. Right, I've never done it. No, it's, it's really good. I mean, it's a couple of hours, but in there, there's like a like a skylight, and it's just like a hole in the in the ceiling that goes up to the roof. Yeah. And, and he gets, you go around the tour and he goes and he gets everybody in to stand under this and then you clap your hands and this massive reverb. That's what oh, all the yeah. reverb on the Motown track is. It's just this hole in the ceiling. Wow. How, how deep is it then? I, 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 it's I, two I, floors up, this hole. But it's and it's up. amazing. And it, it's, so it's like a cylindrical. Yeah, it was just, hole. It's just like a, it was like a chimney almost in a way. Right. But that's what he said. All, all those hand claps that you hear on Motown records, it's yeah. a, a real thing. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a, an effect or it's not wow. something they put on the desk. It's just, it's really there. It's funny. I mean, I've never done the Motown tour. I'm a big Elvis fan, as I mentioned earlier. I've never been to Graceland. You've never been to Graceland? Never, oh. never been. Just never had the opportunity. I mean, like on, on my travels with the band, I mean, me and Graham traditionally nip off and do a bit of sightseeing. You know, like went to um, uh, the, the Kennedy, where Kennedy got shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Grassy Knoll. We went there as soon as we arrived in Dallas. Well, um, the Grassy Knoll Gallagher, didn't you? Uh, yeah, we did. That, is it, sorry, say again. I said you went to the Grassy Knoll with Grassy Knoll Gallagher. Yeah, Grassy Knoll, yeah. yeah. I, thought, I thought it was a, a grass joke then to do with smoking <laughs> weed, which he used to do a lot of. Um, 
Yeah, so yeah, we did a bit of sightseeing on our travels, but never never made it to Graceland or the Motown Museum. And the, the other one there, of course, if you're in Detroit, if you're ever in Det- uh, sorry, if you're ever in Memphis, uh, is the Sun Studios. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah again, never been there yet, but it gives me something to uh, look forward to next time I get a successful pop group together. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can go without a band, you know. You'll have to go. Can't, can't afford it, mate. I've got. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm behind with my tax now. After that pandemic, I'm right behind with my tax. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, well, yeah. That was brilliant, that, uh, uh, Clint. That was really, really good. Good to talk to you. Good to and, talk uh, to you too, as well. And it's a privilege, uh, you know, amazing. speaking to you both. Yeah. Absolutely privilege. No, brilliant. And uh, take care of yourself. And I hope we, uh, we'll, we'll speak again. I'm sure we could get another three hours hours out of this if you really wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if you want to do a follow up at some point, just um, we, we'd have to go on. I try not repeat myself, but there's, there's so much to talk. Just, you know, what, one, of, one of the things I've not talked about, and you can cut this into the into or just leave it here if you want. But yeah. with, the, with the four more than any other band that I can think of, that uh, did they do like thirty studio albums, thirty one? Thirty. Um, well, there's, there's a bit of there's a bit of to and fro in about how many what yeah. constitutes a studio album and stuff as well. But so I, I I collected you know, probably the first half of those up to album. Um, infotainment scam middle class revolt that sort of era that even up to albums 10 11 12 that they were still recording and releasing like uh career defining tunes or, or certainly style what you know fall classics yeah. do you know what i mean yeah like on uh curious orange it was uh uh big new prince yeah it the north came well into the was it Friends Experiment was number album nine or ten, so it wasn't just like the first couple of albums had some great tunes on it, and then they got a bit shit. It was like well into the the, um, the release schedule, they were putting out you know genre defining tunes. Yeah. Um, and I know I know James are good at that as well because James stick to yeah. promoting the new music and not just yeah. Rel- rel- hits. So so James is still releasing records two or three years ago that James classics like moving on is a beautiful tune by James. And yeah, I think so, I, can, sorry, go on. I, can, I can't think of another band that, that, that do what the fall have done over the years that, you know, they, 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 just, they just kept coming out with these greatest you know? fall, fall songs ever. You know what I mean? After album 12. Yeah, or d- 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 I mean, d- depending on who you talk to, you know, you'll get a, plenty of people argue that, that even up until the last albums, they were still, as vital and as important as any fall album ever was, which is again, it's very, there's very few artists you can say that about. Absolutely, if yeah. any. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the thing about James is, which I always think's brave. It's all very well for the fall, and you're playing a club, and you're not playing any yeah. old stuff. But they play them right. festivals, yeah, and they play, and they still yeah. refuse to do sit down. <laughs> yeah. And they're still brilliant. They're just yeah, always yeah. brilliant, and, and you know, like even the last album, they really released an album uh, just after the pandemic or towards the end of it, and just some of the best music they've ever yeah. made, and it's like incredible. So yeah, I, they, that's. I can't think of the title. Have you seen the one with the video where it's the ball of wool? And it's the leave, yeah, that, that's leave a light, light on. Is it? Yeah, move, moving on. It's called that moving on. Brilliant. That song. Yeah. And I think he wrote it about, it's either about his mum dying or, it's, it's, or yeah. a, a very close it, family member. I think it is but his mum, yeah. Yeah, and it's, but that video, just the video Jesus alone, makes you, makes you cry, doesn't it? Killer. Absolute yeah. killer, that video. Yeah. <laughs> right, well, so on that bombshell. Okay. Brilliant, right. I'll leave right. you both to it. No doubt see you soon for a drink at some point. Let's do it, yeah, yeah. Please. And well, thanks for having me. Absolute you're pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks again. Yeah, thank All you. right, guys. Good night, God bless. Bye. 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 Yeah, man. Thanks for joining us on episode 10 of series 2 of Old Brother. Episodes are released every second Monday, so watch your episode 11 in two weeks' time. Please follow us on Twitter, at Old Brother Show. You can find a link to Spotify, subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher or RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, give us a rating on iTunes. Subscribe on the YouTubes, or just tell your friends. For further reading, you can check out our books about the fall, Big Midweek and Have a Bleeding Guest, from Root Publishers and all good bookstores. Hope to speak to you all again soon, and remember, if you're driving, take your car. Ta-da.